Welcome back. Thanks for coming back. Let's talk about the decongestants now. So in the sympathetic nervous system, adrenergic effector cells contain two very distinct receptors. Those are the alpha receptors and the beta receptors. And the decongestants are sympathomimetic amines that are used to relieve congestion, particularly the nasal congestion caused by colds, allergies, and upper respiratory infections. So they promote sinus drainage and they promote the, uh, use, relieve the eustachian tube congestion. Now, because of the sympathomimetic effects, decongestants can cause nervous system stimulation. Just a few minutes ago, remember I said they have uh, the adrenergic effector cells contain two distinct receptors, the alpha receptors and the beta receptors. Well, the alpha receptors at the activities of those uh, alpha adrenergics are vasoconstriction of the arterioles. So that leads to increased blood pressure, dilation of the pupils, intestinal relaxation, and bladder sphincter contraction. And then our beta receptors are divided into beta 1 and beta 2. The beta 1 receptors um, are cardio, they work uh, to cardio accelerate, they also increase myocardial contractility, whereas the beta-2 receptors, when they're stimulated, they can cause vasodilation of the skeletal muscle, bronchodilation, uterine relaxation, and bronch, or, excuse me, bladder re, uh, relaxation. So when we're looking at the sympathomimetic activities of these drugs, we need to be aware that these can cause the central nervous system stimulation. They can cause cardiovascular collapse with hypotension, and they can cause convulsions. So we always use these in caution with any patient that has a cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, hyperthyroidism, diabetes mellitus, prostatic hypertrophy, any type of urinary tension, or increased intraocular pressure. Um, patients with hypertension can also have blood pressure changes as a result of the vasoconstriction. So when we look at these decongestants and we're looking at the adrenergics, this is our largest group, that's sympathomimetics. Our anticholinergics can be used, but they are less commonly used, and there are parasympatholytics. When we um, apply them, sometimes we'll also use corticosteroids, and those are applied topically. Those are intranasal steroids. We see two dosage forms. Remember I said we have the topical or the inhaled that we can apply directly to the nasal membranes, and, uh, and then we have the oral type. We can get sustained release formulations because they have a less um, strenuous effect on the cardiovascular system. So sometimes you will see the use of, of those formulations. And um, there are some that have less effect on the blood pressure. So that's a prescriber's um, area, of their domain there, their, their scope of practice. But just be aware that you will see both types. Now on our intranasal steroids, these are inhaled, they're topically applied, and those should be used for at least a month before deciding if they're effective. But patients need to be warned that improvement doesn't usually begin until about one week at least after starting the therapy. Internasal steroids also are used to help shrink polyps, nasal polyps. Exceeding the recommended dose of the nasal steroid, however, can be dangerous because we want the patient not to do that. We want them to be compliant. So they need to understand that if they exceed the recommended dose with an intranasal steroid, they will often get a systemic effect, and that can include suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal function. So we want to be sure they have good patient education. Just because it's a spray doesn't mean that it won't be systemic. Now our oral decongestants, they usually have a pro, uh, delayed onset, but a prolonged decongestant effect. They can be used in combination with antihistamines and expectorants in both over-the-counter and prescription doses. So um, we will also see 
um, occasionally one of them included in an over-the-counter product that is used as appetite suppressant. So uh, that's something for patients to be aware of if they're using those medications, that these can be involved. The good thing about the oral decongestants is that although their effect is less potent than the topical, they don't get rebound congestion. They are pretty exclusively adrenergic. And our example for that is our pseudofedrin or pseudofed. Now, our topical nasal decongestants, as I said earlier, we can have, um, it takes sometimes longer for this to work. They're topical adrenergics, and they have a pretty prompt onset. They are potent, and they work really well. Um, but you can get a thing called rebound congestion, and sustained use over several days does cause rebound congestion, making the condition worse. So uh, that's called rhinitis medicamentosa, and rebound congestion, the, the medical name is rhinitis medicamentosa. And that's when we have this vasoconstriction because the patients increase the amount of the drug and the frequency of it, then they get further rebound congestion. And the treatment for the rebound congestion includes com uh, gradual withdrawal. We initially discontinue the medication in one nostril, followed by total withdrawal in the other. Um, we want to use caution with these medications for that very reason. Now, with our adrenergics, you'll see our phenylene, our neosinephrine, there are others on the market. Our intranasal ster uh, steroids, that's our fluticasone. Flonase is the most common. You'll also see beclomethasone, dipropionate, um, and some others on the market. But those usually are the ones, the intranasal steroids are the ones that take a long time to work. So one to two weeks, they're not going to see symptom resolution, but those steroids can become systemic, particularly if the patient uses more than prescribed or more than directed. Uh, the site of action is the blood vessels surrounding the nasal sinuses with our adrenergics. They constrict that small blood vessel supply uh, that the URI structures are there. And as a result, the tissues shrink and the nasal secretions in the swollen mucosa are able to drain better. So the nasal stuffiness is then released and relieved. Um, with the uh, nasal steroids, we have an anti-inflammatory effect. So they work to turn off the immune cell system, uh, immune system cells, those mast cells that are involved in the inflammatory process. And as a result, the, there's a decrease in the inflammation. The decreased inflammation results in decreased congestion. Nasal stuffiness is released. So with our nasal decongestions, shrinking the engorged nasal mucosa is in the ultimate goal and that relieves the nasals, the nasal stuffiness. <laughs> so as we said, why we use these are for the release of nasal congestion. It can be associated with acute or chronic rhinitis, the common cold, sinusitis, hay fever, or other allergies. There is the precaution of topical decongestions being used in acute states we should not use them for longer than three to five days. Remember, you can have this rebound congestion. And some products contain sulfites. So it's very important that your patient know their allergies and that their allergies are listed on their charts because those products that contain sulfites can actually cause an, allerg an allergic reaction in people with sulfite sensitivities. The uh, nasal decongestions can also be used to reduce swelling of the nasal passage and facilitate the visualization when we are having nasal or pharyngeal surgery or for particular diagnostic procedures. So they are sometimes used for that reason. Um, with our adverse effects, with the adrenergics, we'll see nervousness, insomnia, sometimes palpitations and tremors because of those systemic effects due to the adrenergic stimulation of the heart, the blood vessels, and the central nervous system. And then with the steroids, we'll get local mucosal dryness and sometimes irritation. We want to be sure that there isn't infection present if we're using the steroids because um, with the Intranasal steroids, they're contraindicated in an untreated localized infection. 
uh, we could also have infections that can develop like Candida albicans because they're steroids, right? So they will feed those bugs and we don't want to, we don't want to do that. So we want to use them with caution and make sure there isn't a, a bacterial infection present or fungal infection present. We also want to use them with caution in patients who are at risk for tuberculosis or if they're at risk for any fungal infection. Um, if they're going to use these intranasal steroids long term, the patient needs to also be in, advised to watch for changes in the nasal mucosa because long term use of steroids will change the nasal mucosa itself. And that can lead to some complications or some problems with that tissue. What are the nursing implications for these medications? Well, the decongestants can cause hypertension, palpitations, and CNS stimulation, as we talked about earlier. So we avoid the in, in patients with these conditions. Patients on medication therapy for hypertension should always check with their physician before taking any over-the-counter decongestant. And then, as I said, with the sulfites, a check for drug allergies, all types of drug allergies. I also want these patients to avoid caffeine and caffeine containing products. Remember, caffeine is a drug. And what does it do? It vasoconstricts, but it also, remember, is a diuretic. So avoid caffeine and caffeine containing products. They're to report any fever, cough, or other symptoms that last longer for a week, except if they're being treated long term with those intranasal steroids for a long-term allergy condition. We want to monitor then for the intended therapeutic effect, which is decreased congestion in the nasal mucosa. So that's all about the decongestants. We'll take a break, come back and talk about the antitussives. See you soon.